So in my one year as a member of this club, just this month, I have uh, brought to you a series of three programs on state government and politics. And the first of them was me talking about the subject of political polarization and how state legislatures function in the same polarized world as the United States Congress, but for the most part, state legislatures are much better at getting things done and overcoming that polarization. The second one was just a few weeks ago, right before the election, when uh, Patrick Papiandi uh, gave you a preview of uh, ballot initiatives this year. Our third speaker from this organization that many of you probably have never heard of, the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, is today, uh, Tim Story. And uh, uh, Tim and I, I, I don't need any notes to introduce Tim at all. Uh, he and I worked together for more than 30 years. Uh, when he came to NCSL as a relative relatively recent graduate of Mars Hill College in North Carolina, it was immediately apparent to us that he was a political junkie. Tim lives and breathes politics. And in the course of his time at NCSL, uh, where he is a division director and responsible for whole wide range of services uh, to state legislatures. He does a lot of training and professional development programs in most of the states and in many foreign countries. Um, uh, Tim has developed a, a really remarkable network of people. He, I, I'm willing to bet he knows more elected officials than just about anybody uh, in the country. And uh, so Tim, uh, in his work on uh, national election results, is frequently quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, he's on television. And so join me in welcoming, please, Tim's story. Thank you very much, Carl. That is really appreciated and uh, and um, I have tremendous respect for my colleague Carl Kurtz. Um, I assume most of you know Carl. Uh, I don't know if you know that his birthday was two days ago, so I hope you had a chance to wish him a happy birthday. And uh, like I said, it's humbling. He has forgotten more about state legislatures than I will ever know. And I am fully aware of that, so thank you for that. Um, you have probably heard as much or more than you would ever care to know about what happened in the U.S. House elections and in the U.S. State elections. So I'm going to talk a little bit about state elections. I hope uh, this uh, resonates with you. Um, it is very important. Um, these are often called the hidden elections because they don't get the headlines. They don't get the national media attention. And there's been a marked decline in the coverage of state legislatures in the media generally. State house reporters have been cut, and so they don't get the attention that they deserve in states anymore. And that is a real troubling sign because the people that are 7,383 state legislators in America in the 50 states, and the work that they do in conjunction with the executive and the governors, they, they budget over three trillion dollars in public money every year. So they're doing sort of amazing sort of public policy work that oftentimes goes unattended or unnoticed by the, the general public. So put that a little bit in context. I am going to race through some election results on the states, talk a little bit about some of the ballot measures. My colleague Patrick Pagani was here just a few weeks ago. And, uh, and then hopefully have a little time for questions. And I need to start my clock because I have a restrict orders on the time of this. <laughs> Apparently there's a couple of dudes that will come and drag me out when uh, it gets 20 minutes. So as I said, 7,383 state legislators, about 80%, 6,066 of them were up for elections every two years. So every two year election cycle is a big election cycle. But in some ways this is a bigger year at the governor's level. 36 uh, U.S. senators were up. In New Hampshire and Vermont, they're up every two years. 
Um, and then there are a few states that want to compete here in Louisiana, Mississippi, New Jersey, and Virginia to have elections the odd number of years. And then a few states that they will do the same um, on a four year cycle. Big election here in the states. Going in, in uh, before the election, this was a Republican world. There were 32 legislatures controlled by the GOP. Um, and that's a little misleading because Minnesota was only tied because of the vacancy just before the election. So it was really 33, including Minnesota, which is the most Republican legislatures in the history of the United States. So um, the states were controlled by the GOP at a record unseen um, in the history of the Republican Party and really in the history of the United States, which goes back to like the 1850s. Um, 14 states were Democratic, and only four had divided state legislatures. So that's before the election. And in every two year election cycle, 12 legislative chambers switched party control. So there's, by the way, there's 99 legislative chambers in the 50 states. We don't know why that is, why it's 99. Whoa, this is an educated crowd, man. <laughs> this is the number of people answered. Yes, the Nebraska legislature, by the way, not only in the panel, but technically nonpartisan. They don't run as Democrats and Republicans, so 99 chambers. But only six changed party control, and four of them are, have changed four times in the last five election cycles. So these are sort of the usual suspects, so to speak. All of them except for one moves in the Democratic direction, and then they last the House. This is an interesting story. I want to take just a second to talk about that, because the Alaska House... Um, had, uh, it is tied as of today, and it's not only tied, but there's one house race in Fairbanks, Alaska House District 1, where the Democrat got 2,661 votes, and the Republican got 2,661 votes. So the control of the Alaska House will be determined today, because the election board is meeting to decide how to deal with this ballot. And you're going to have a little trouble seeing this in the back, but some, uh, uh, some voter, and everybody wants a perfect election, no perfect elections. But keep in mind, on every election every two years, there are a million volunteers running our elections. Keep that in mind. A million volunteers. In a presidential election, about 125 million Americans vote. So there's a lot of human elements in how we run elections. And one voter in Alaska decided to put a global next to Catherine Dodge and put an X on the Republican, Mark Lamont. So the election officials have to decide what are we going to do with this ballot, right? Because the machine kicked it out. The machine tally kicks it out and says, this is a weird ballot. So they have their meeting today. Although there has been a massive earthquake in Alaska this morning. I don't know if you've heard about this. Um, so we don't know if they're going to be able to meet. So you can get on Twitter and figure that out. Um, so, and, and, and so my point here is every vote counts. And then we, you know, we say that and there's, some truth to it, some not truth to it, because most elections are actually decided by you know big margins. But here in Alaska, control the last house will come down to this. This is from Virginia in 2017. The Virginia House of Delegates tied 50 Republicans, 50 Democrats, one race tied. And this is the ballot they had to decide what to do with. And they counted this for the Republican. They said that the voter intended to strike out their first choice and vote for the Republican. So Republican took control of the Virginia House of Delegates. There you go, counsel. So now state legislatures, Republican Democrats gained four states, Republicans lose one, they're down to 31. And what do you think? What's interesting about this map? What do you see when you look at this map? Anybody? What stands out? <laughs> Minnesota. There's one divided state. For the first time since 1914, we only have one divided legislature in the country. So the country has really gotten red state and blue state at the legislative level, more than we have seen in over 100 years. All right, so this is just sort of general control of legislators across time back to 1900. By the way, all this data, courtesy of Carl Kurtz, thank you very much. Um, he ran it, he did this database back to 1900. Um, <laughs> so he wasn't here. He was not around in 1900, but he did have the data. So what you can see is that for about 50 years, this is for about 50 years, the Democrats were dominant in state legislatures. And then here in the, in the 2000s, well, really, this is the Duke Gingrich 1994 election. Republicans make huge gains. And then it's sort of even, but then the Republicans go up. They had more seats before the election than any time since the 1920, the Warren G. Harding administration. Who remembers the Harding administration? Carl, you. 
Any hard in your memory? Any hard scholars in the room, by any chance? There are a lot of hard scholars I found uh, as I've gone around in this talk. But anyway, so now we're close. 53% of all legislators are Republican, 37% are Democrats. Um, and this is just sort of a line chart showing the control of the chambers. And again, you see the yellow line of the divide goes down to one. Last time it was 1914. So midterm elections are terrible for the party of the White House, just as a rule. So if you can see, this is what they call a trend in social sciences. Um, these are all midterm elections, 30 midterm elections since 1902. And in every one of them, the party of the White House, Republicans this year, obviously, lose seats in legislatures, except for two exceptions. Right after 9-11, uh, George Bush and Republicans gained 135 seats. And in 1934, in the teeth of the Great Depression, uh, Roosevelt and the Democrats gained over 1,000 seats. This is a different time, by the way, because of the redistricting. We don't have time to get into that. Um, so, um, and the average loss is 415. Keep that in mind. So, so let me talk about the governors a little bit. What happened to governors' races? Stark contracts to governors this year. And let me just tee this up. The, this election was about Donald Trump. And we can talk about that if you like, but at the end of the day, there's a political scientist in University of St. Louis named Steve Rock, not Captain America, a different guy. And he did a study, and he has determined that, that the, what the president says of either party has three times more impact, with all due respect for President Huda, um, than any, uh, anything the legislator says in an election. You can get swamped by whether or not your person in the White House is popular or not. And this was especially true in these 36 governor races. So let me just show you this ad. Go ahead and hit that, Fred. Here my nose, my husband, Ron DeSantis, is endorsed by President Trump. He's also an amazing dad. This is Laura loves playing with the kids. Build the wall. He reads the stories. That much for Trump said, you're a fire. I love that part. He's teaching Madison to talk. Maybe he can come in Great again. People say Ron's all Trump, but he is so much more. So good. I just thought you should know. So what was the message? What was the message this guy was trying to send? He went over and he hugged Donald Trump and he gave him a big kiss and he patted him on the head. He said, vote for me because I'm voting for Donald Trump. His opponent, a guy named Andrew Gillum, who's the mayor of Tallahassee, read this ad. Now, before you cue it, Fred, um, pay attention. There are these, these words that will blast out of you and see if you can see some of the words that blast out in this ad. Go ahead, Fred. My mother said the only thing in life you should ever ask for is a chance. So I want you to know that if you give me the chance, not only to be your nominee, but to be the next governor of the great state of Florida, I don't think you can see what So I want y'all to jump in on this mission, right? And together we're going to take this day back, clear Florida blue in 2018, and put this country blue in 2020. <laughs> What do you think he stands for? I mean, <laughs> what were some of the words? What did you see come up? Impeach Trump, which I'm pretty sure the Florida governor doesn't have the authority to do, but he was right on that. Legalize weed, uh, abolish ice, another thing that you can't do as a governor of Florida. Uh, but he was clearly running an anti Trump campaign, which was very true across most of these governor races. Um, I don't have a lot of time to show you, but they're just amusing at some level. So I've got one more. This is the Republican nominee in. Georgia, and by the way, uh, Gillum narrowly lost Ron DeSantis in Florida. So DeSantis narrowly won the Florida governor's face in Florida. Um, this one uh, advanced it and then hit it. I'm Ron Kemp. I'm so conservative. I blow up government spending. I own guns. And no one's taking away. Ron DeSantis is the governor of Florida. 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 Just in case I need to round up criminal illegals and take them home myself. <laughs> yeah, I just said that. I'm Ron Kemp. If you want a politically incorrect conservative, that's me. Now you're probably thinking, that had probably with go in Colorado, and you're probably right about that. <laughs> this is Georgia. Um, and actually, you know, Brad Kemp's brother in law is an active member of NCSL. He's the Senate majority leader, believe it or not. And uh, I talked to uh, Bill Calder, who's the brother-in-law, and I said, Bill, the brother-in-law, he went through full Dukes of Hazzard, you say. <laughs> he said, he sure did it. And he narrowly, narrowly won. He beat uh, Stacey Abrams, who was the, the state house of the year in, uh, in, in 
Georgia. So in the governor's races, they really were going, they were tacking you with or without <laughs> So prior to the election, also 33 Republican governors, the most in America's history, was a tie, actually, if it was before 33. And then after the election, Democrats made huge gains. I might have to look at my list just to make sure I don't miss any of these. Um, but the Democrats picked seven um, Nevada, New Mexico, Kansas, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, and Maine, all went uh, from Republican governors to Democrat governors. And actually, there was an independent governor in Alaska, which is now Republican. Um, so he actually wanted to drop me out. It's a long story. You can do it if you're interested. So, what does it mean in terms of overall government control? Who's controlling the states in terms of policy making and setting the agenda, the priorities for this three trillion dollars in public funding? Republicans still have twenty-three states under their banner. Democrats have seven, and only four states. I'm sorry, thirteen states. I read the wrong numbers. Democrats have 14 plus 7, uh, 13 are divided minus 4. So again, in terms of overall state control, we're headed towards uh, more polarization. So, except, and this is somewhat the case in uh, Colorado. Uh, does anybody recognize any of these people? Probably not. Uh, no, they're not. But they look like the former governors, don't they? This is good. <laughs> Like, you know why? And who, most of you have been to the state capital. I see very good. If you wander state capitals around this country, there are class photos, usually the face of the, like the, the class of 1919. Oh, as a matter of fact, so these are all portraits of legislators in 1919. For 100, this is 100 years ago. And in 1919, pretty much every state legislator in the country was a white male. Um, and in fact, there was one woman in the Colorado legislature, um, May Tower. Bigelow, and this is not a picture of her, but this is a representation of that. No, 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 in the Colorado legislature. So this is what it looked like in state legislatures uh, 100 years ago. This is a picture from election night of the Senate, I'm sorry to say. I should have done the House. Um, but obviously, this is the Senate Democrats. There are now a record number of women in the Colorado legislature, and that's one of the biggest stories out of this election. So if you can see here, back in 1895, um, less than well, about two or three percent of all state legislators were women, and then you go all the way over here to 1973, it's still under five percent. And then in the 1970s, you see women really start to take ground as elected officials and running this country and doing that work on the policies that matter to people transportation, schools, and health care. And now, one of the biggest spikes ever, women gained four percent in terms of their overall numbers, and now about 28 percent of all state legislators. Are women. Thank you. One of the biggest changes in state legislature. Um, in fact, we should be proud. Colorado had the second most women as a percentage of our state legislature. The Colorado State Senate is a majority, I'm sorry, the House is a majority of women. The only other chamber in the country like that, the Nevada Assembly, so only two chambers have a majority of women uh, winning, the, uh, winning the state house. Um, just a few more things on elections that I talked about the INR. Um, redistricting is coming. I had a lot to do with this election. We can talk about that some more. I just want to show this. These are the projections based on the 2017 population estimate for the states. As you can see, the blue states are the sad states. They're losing seats in Congress. The yellow states are the happy states. They're gaining seats in Congress. So there's a seat coming to Colorado if any of you are interested in a job. Uh, <laughs> But well, we also adopted a new redistricting process in Colorado, so it gets more complicated. Um, but redistricting was a big factor because, for the most part, state legislators still draw the maps for the U.S. House as well as their own maps. Um, that is changing slowly. There are more redistricting reforms. We'll catch on those in a second. Um, but um, so legislators had drawn you know, plans. That's part of the reason the GOP didn't get knocked out as much as they did. The, the Republicans only had a net loss of state legislatures of 313 seats. So when there was a blue wave in the U.S. House, there was a blue wave in the governors, not a blue wave in the U.S. Senate. There was not a blue wave in state legislatures. It was a good showing for Democrats. The Republicans really sort of did not have the huge losses you might have seen. All right, initiatives. So 24 states allow citizens to put things on the general ballot. Of course, Colorado was one of them. Um, there's a lot of debate about the wisdom of this process um, and how it's being used by uh, people with money and these kinds of things. 
But so these are the states. There were 160 members on the ballots nationwide. Let's start with, uh, since we're talking about creating, let's start with marijuana on the ballot. Um, there were five states that had uh, marijuana measures. And as you can see, three states passed medical, Missouri, Oklahoma, Utah, and Michigan passed retail. North Dakota was the, only the second state that's turned down retail uh, sales of marijuana. But now, you know, Colorado used to be somewhat unique. Now there are 10 states plus BC that will have recreational retail marijuana sales. So that's uh, something you might find interesting. And then redistricting is changing slowly. There's been a new sort of recognition of how that plays into our democratic institutions and how it's been done. Um, so it's slowly being taken out of the traditional legislative process. And in this election, Ohio passed a fairly major reform, as did Michigan. Colorado and Missouri actually already had Michigan commissions, but they changed them to make them more neutral, more nonpartisan, and sort of insulate them from partisan ability to manipulate them. And Utah passed a Michigan measure sort of an advisory commission. Um, Medicaid, it's interesting. So you know about Medicaid expansion, and that was part of the Affordable Care Act. The number of states did it, the number of states did it. But what was interesting is that they could really did it to be the Democratic states expand Medicaid, the Republican states did not expand Medicaid. But in the election in Idaho, Nebraska, and Utah, not exactly blue Democratic states, all three of them passed Medicaid expansion when the voters got to the side. Um, and then Montana had a measure that would have expanded uh, or would extended their uh, Medicaid expansion. They actually turned that down since a tax on tobacco. Um, and then Oregon uh, passed a funding measure for their Medicaid expansion. So quick quiz, two of these great states passed uh, strict abortion limits. You know which two? <laughs> you are correct. Uh, uh, in fact, the measure in Alabama is probably the strictest uh, abortion limits in the nation. I'm um, almost certain to wind up with the Supreme Court, so that's something to keep an eye on. Um, a number of states voted on tax measures, including Colorado, as you all know. Um, the one on the education failed here. Uh, Maine also failed to pass a tax measure. But 16 of 18 bond measures passed, which are typically to fund big infrastructure projects. So voters did have some appetite for investing in infrastructure. And then California passed a tax on income that over a million dollars. Uh, to help do homelessness prevention and work for homelessness. Um, the minimum wage was approved higher than the wages in Arkansas and Missouri. They weren't, I think they went up to like $11 in, in Arkansas, maybe 10 in Missouri, and just graduated over time. Uh, but now you have 19 states that have a minimum wage uh, over the federal minimum. Um, there were a number of things on energy and environment. Um, Alaska had to enter protect sand water, to see on carbon emissions in Washington, which would have really been. A dramatic sort of move by a state. Those failed. Um, Arizona had a 50% renewable measure that failed, but uh, the back did pass a requirement for 50% renewables by 2030. So that's a pretty bold environmental move by the voters in the back. And then you know Colorado, uh, they just have trouble with the vaccine to slow down. But Colorado failed that our voters did not approve a rapid setback regulation. And then Montana had some binding uh, limits they also uh, declined to approve. And then finally, a couple more. Um, there are a big crime victims' rights. There's a big movement. It's not very controversial. It passed. I don't know a lot of detail. It was on the ballot in six states, passed in all six. It's a great sort of case study in how you uh, uh, have sort of a nationwide movement using this initiative process. Um, a few other notable ones, of course, Colorado voters uh, passed the pay lending limitations. Um, uh, Massachusetts was the first state to put a constitutional measure in to protect transgender. Uh, citizens of Massachusetts. Nevada voters uh, passed a measure that will uh, prohibit the state from ever taxing to the hygiene project or products, also as a key tax. School vouchers expansion was defeated in Arizona. And then I love this in, Arizona, in New Hampshire, um, they put in the Constitution a right to live free from government intrusion measure to their state <laughs> Constitution. Did anybody get from New Hampshire? Anybody <laughs> got from New Hampshire? No? All right. And did you serve in the legislature there, sir? <laughs> No, I got it done. New Hampshire House has 400 members. 400, 400 members. So pretty much everybody who lives in New Hampshire is required to serve in the House. It's also true, by the way. Who knows what the motto with the New Hampshire license plate? And yes, indeed, it is made by prisons. It's a prison industry product. I know. Same or the other. Let me wrap up. The big story out of legislative state elections is 28% turn of state legislators. There are 1,698 new state legislators. That's a big 
number. A lot of work for our organization in terms of training for people there. Again, only one divided state, red states and blue states, record number of women legislators and record number of leaders. Um, redistricting is around the corner. Uh, I hope you guys can talk about the census and the oh, yeah. to promote census participation because that's only a year or so away and that has a major <laughs> impact on uh, many, many programs, both public and oh, private. Um, and then, you know, these are just sort of what impacted the election. You know, getting that really was a Trump issue. And I've seen you know, a lot of the reporting and some preliminary, you know, it takes a while to sort of do some interviews and some research, you know, what really mattered. Uh, but clearly, it was the popular president. This president is, uh, his popular, his approval rating, he's the only president in the history of Gallup polling, which goes back to Harry Truman, who's never been above 50% approval. So he is a very unpopular president. Um, and, and that showed through in many of these elections in this midterm cycle. That's all I have to say. I would love to take questions if you have them. You won't hurt my feelings if you don't have questions. Uh, but thank you so much. Because you did see a blue wave at the House level, although it could have been bigger. Um, yes, that is absolutely true, and I think that there's a, a number of reasons for that. One, the Republicans are so high, even though they lost seats, they didn't lose chambers maybe the way they would have. And two, Republicans gained over 710 legislative seats and picked up 24 legislative chambers in the 2010 election. So what's important about the 2010 election? It's what happens before the 2012 election. So who drew the lines? for the districts that are being run in now. So Republicans had a huge victory in 2010, controlled the redistricting process unlike any party before, and especially given the sophistication of redistricting. And, um, and so they have a lot of, they had a firewall because of their district's control, um, and it paid off for them, they would have lost votes. Thank you for your presentation, it was really interesting. Are you really going to get to tell the story? I'm not. I'm from North Carolina, and okay. I know that we're a whole different so we, we, we that. Uh, oh, right. She, this is the person who ran the Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, my question to you is for the future, how, what do you oh, see wow. the future of all these um, citizen led oppositions? And, and could you also explain a little bit more about the, dis the difference between a constitutional amendment and a proposition? Yes, Carl might be better acquainted to answer this question. But um, the terms get thrown around interchangeably because we talk about referendum. A referendum is typically something that's put on the ballot by the legislature. Um, an initiative is something that's put on through the citizens' ability. Now, some states allow you to amend the Constitution through citizen initiative. Some states only allow you to amend the statutes through citizen initiative. What is it, Carl? Both. So you can amend the Constitution and the statutes in Colorado through the initiative process. So the word, anything that gets on the ballot is sort of commonly referred to as a proposition. Um, but you are correct. The big difference is if I say somebody has put in a statute, then the legislature has the authority to change it if necessary. When it's put in the Constitution, it's nearly impossible to change in most cases. Um, so Colorado has, Colorado has one of the uh, with absolute respect. <laughs> well, our legislature has its hands tied more than pretty much any legislature in the country because of constitutional ballot measures that have been approved by past Colorado voters, um, primarily through the, the budget process. So the Tabor and the Gallagher and the uh, and all that stuff. And so our legislature is probably one of the least powerful in the country because of, because of those budget measures. Yeah. Do you have any questions for us? Yeah. Um, I know you're from North Carolina, and I just saw that there's some litigation that's going on in the House race regarding voter suppression and other types yeah. of voter issues. Sure. What about other states, and what about voter suppression and litigation, especially in Georgia and other things, yeah. regarding essentially making it impossible for people to vote? Yeah. Um, so, 
Uh, it is no doubt there is a raging debate that is going on, primarily it's very partisan, between Republicans on the one hand who claim they want to lock down any potential for voter fraud, um, and Democrats on the other hand who say anytime you change the election laws, you, you in many cases make it more difficult or more, uh, more challenging to vote. Um, so this is where we are, and there's a, there are frankly fair arguments on both sides. Um, although I'm getting a strong head. <laughs> um, I would say, as a nonpartisan person, that, that there are arguments on, on other sides. And the other thing, too, is that voter suppression is sort of a catch-all term that catches a whole lot of like voter ID provisions. And then when you look at voter ID provisions, you have this huge range of, of sort of strict and not strict voter ID provisions. Um, the ease of registration comes into play, which is a big question in Georgia, because they cut off registration and they um, we don't have time to get into it, but they um, uh, clearly there were some serious allegations about the election officials um, trying to you know, sort of lock down the ease of access to the ballot. Um, and again, uh, I think the thing to keep in mind is that our elections are extraordinarily uh, complicated and extraordinarily decentralized. Carl and I have both worked around the world, and what you, when you hear from people around the world about American elections, they are confused by three things. Number one, how decentralized our system is. Now, the reason our system is decentralized is because when the founders set it up, they wanted it to be impervious to uh, fraud at the top. So they thought if we let 50 states run elections, it's made, maybe you could rate one state election, but you can't rate 50 kind of thing. And so it took some two or 13 at the time. <laughs> but, it, but, it's, <laughs> but it's extremely decentralized. We have, we have the most decentralized election system in the world, uh, period. Um, the other thing that they have a hard time with is the Electoral College, which no one in the world understands. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and oh, and the fact that this is interesting. Pretty much every country in the world requires ID to vote. Um, we are unique, in, uh, not totally unique, but we are unique in that you don't, you don't in, most, in many states, have to show an ID to vote. Um, so, you know, we have a different culture in the states in terms of, you know, using identification for many of the things that we use in other countries in the world. Um, so. Um, Hope that helps. I don't think I really answered your question, but I talked long enough. <laughs> <laughs> looks like we got a call. That's right. Looks like we got a hook. Um, so first of all, I want, on behalf of the Golden Rotary, Tim, I want to thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. Um, you're very active here in Boulder politically, which keeps me twice as busy as most legislators and my colleagues. Um, I just, so that all of you know, uh, the National Conference of State Legislators um, are a tremendous resource to state legislators around the country. Um, one of the things they do, if you have an idea for running a piece of legislation, before you reinvent the wheel, you go to the NCSL and say, has any other state passed this law or some version of it? How did it succeed? What does it look like? So they're a great resource for that. They're also a great resource for research, um, especially for a space like Colorado. We only meet four and a half months a year. And uh, we have over five million people, and we have a lot of business to take care of in that short amount of time. That's when our committees meet, that's when we deliberate on legislation, and that is when we pass our annual state budget. It's a big job and it's very compressed. And so we need quite heavily on NCSL to support us in that endeavor. Uh, also, your term limited. So once you get elected, you have to hit the ground running. And um, once again, uh, another reason why we need so heavily on the NCSL. So I want to thank you very much for all the work you do. Say Carl also. Yeah. Uh, so, in honor, sir, of uh, the Boulder Rotary Club, we are pleased to contribute 100 doses of vaccine to the Polio Plus Fund. Wow, that's awesome. Yes. After 26 years of arduous work, Rotary and its partners are on the brink of eradicating this tenacious disease. But a strong push is needed now, not to root it out once and for all, to root it out once and for all. It is conceivable for polio to be eradicated in the next few years. It is a window of opportunity of historic proportions, 
as we move forward with the polio endgame strategy. If we all have the fortitude to see this effort through to the end, then we will eradicate polio. Um, and this is from Bill Gates and the Bill Gates Foundation has initiated this program. So thank you all and thank you, Tim.